Hello there, Indian Mills United Methodist Church family, friends, and visitors. I'm Jack Orr, the pastor here at Indian Mills United Methodist Church. Welcome to week two of the Living Faith series. But before we begin today, we have a special message from our bishop, John Scholl. I'm John Scholl, a bishop in the United Methodist Church serving Greater New Jersey and Eastern Pennsylvania. Today, I come to you with a heavy heart. Ida, the storm, caught us all by surprise, and we're still learning about the damage that was done by Ida. We're seeing that uh, seven of our churches were badly flooded. One of our parsonages was flooded. We also see in communities devastation, people having to get out of their homes, many people rescued. More than 25 people died here in New Jersey because of Ida. This has been a devastating storm. No, it's not as, as, as great as Superstorm Sandy, but the lives and the churches that have been impacted have been every bit as significant as Superstorm Sandy was. And so we're gonna to need to work together. We're gonna to need to work together to help churches rebuild. We're gonna to need to work together to help communities and, and neighbors rebuild. There are people who are out of their homes. It'll take uh, years for some of them to get back in their homes. And it will happen because Greater New Jersey comes together and helps in our communities. We did this during Superstorm Sandy. We had a significant impact all across Greater New Jersey, and we're gonna have that same kind of impact. It may not be as large, but the lives that were impacted are every bit as impactful as Superstorm Sandy. So today, I'm asking you to give generously. We've started a fund to help people here in New Jersey to recover from Ida. You can go to our webpage, www.gnjumc.org and make your contribution or take an offering in your church and send it to us. Some of it is going to go to Louisiana because they've got challenging ch problems there and some of it will continue here in Greater New Jersey to help our neighbors. You know, this is our opportunity to do all the good we can so that God will shine in our communities. This is our opportunity to come together as United Methodists and show that we are stronger together. And this is our time to remember, as Jeremiah 29, 11 says, God did not bring us to this place for our destruction, but a future with hope. With you and your generosity and working together, there is a future with hope for people and communities that have been uh, destroyed, for churches that need to rebuild, for other communities and families that need our help at this time. So let's all work together for a future with hope. In the Living Faith Worship Series, we are focusing on our Wesleyan heritage through the lens of James' epistle. Let's get ourselves ready for week two of the Living Faith Series. If someone asks you, what is faith? What would you say? What about if someone asked, what does faith look like? Sometimes, we want to put faith in a box, a Sunday morning church box. Or we think faith is about saying, thinking, and believing the right things. But there's so much more to faith than that. In the Bible, we see that faith is about being rooted in a relationship with God that changes the way we live and that has the power to change the world. John Wesley, who started the Methodist movement, sums up the faith in action in three principles. Three general rules. Oh, like stop, look, listen, or shake, rattle, and roll. No, brother, you know our general rules. Do no harm, do good, attend upon all the ordinances of God. Or as I like to say, practice showing up for God. As we trust in God's promises to transform us, let's awaken our faith together as we explore living faith.
Words hold the power of life and death. What we say matters. Let us speak life and back up our words with loving actions. Today, we will connect what James says about taming the tongue to the first of John Wesley's three general rules, which is do no harm. So let's worship God with our tongues of praise that are tamed to do no harm and speak words of life backed up by loving actions. Friends, I invite you to pray with me now, today's opening prayer. Let us pray. God, you spoke and the world was ordered. Through worshiping you today, may we remember the power of our speech too. May we, may we recommit to speak in ways that help create hope and not harm, justice and not suffering. May our words flow forth faithfully and truthfully to honor you and care for each other. Amen. James chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal or take ships in as, as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider when a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. 
With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our gospel reading this morning is from Mark, chapter 8, verses 27 to 38. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach him that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. He then called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. My dad's words could be hurtful and damaging. Dad began calling me Jackie Pumpkin at age two because I was a chubby kid. Perhaps that's why I like being thin today. Dad also called me step and fetch it if I did not move fast enough doing chores. Maybe that affected my multitasking skills. Dad enjoyed reading to me Ivan the Ninny, saying that I reminded him of Ivan the Ninny or fool. He was delighted when he learned that Ivan is Russian for John. Apparently, Dad didn't know the moral of Ivan the Ninny was that Ivan was rarely the fool. He was merely perceived as such by others. Still, Dad used those words to describe me, and those words hurt. Maybe that's why I feel inadequate. Dad also said, I Hope you have 10 kids just like you, implying that I was annoying. I wonder if that's why I don't have biological children of my own. Words are powerful. 
Unfortunately, I've spoken unkindly to some kids at times. One hot July day on an Ocean City, New Jersey beach, chaperoning youth from an inner city church, one of the kids kept begging another chaperone and I to come into the water. I declined, but he kept coming back again and again and again. Finally, I blurted out sarcastically, why don't you just go swim to England? Well, about five minutes later, I heard the lifeguard blowing his whistle loudly. I saw one lifeguard waving someone to come in while another was getting into the rowboat. I looked out at the water and swimming far away from the shore was this kid I just told to go swim to England. I imagine this kid heard other adults tell him many times to get lost or go swim to England in some ways during his teen years because he eventually started hanging out with the wrong gang, using and dealing drugs, getting sent to rehab and returning home and well, doing well until one day he ran into some members of that old gang, that wrong gang, and they did not like his reformed new self. And so they sent him away permanently. His mutilated body was found in a dumpster. Words are powerful. The tongue can be dangerous and deadly. Words can haunt us the rest of our lives and their harm to us can be passed on to others. Think about words that someone has said to you that have stuck with you, especially from other Christians. We've all been helped or hurt by the words of others. Whether we admit it or not, we have spoken words of hurt and words of help as well. In verses one through five, of our first reading, James urges believers who are aspiring to be teachers or overseers to think seriously before leading and speaking to other people. As sinful human beings, we are capable of spewing poisonous words. We are also capable of kind and helpful words. James writes that those who control their tongue control their whole being, like a bridled horse whose body is controlled by the tiny bit in its mouth. He compares the tongue to a large ship moved by strong winds, yet steered by a small rudder. Friends, if we allow our rudderless tongues to boast wildly, to mislead by false teaching, by put downs or gossip. We are doing great harm and need to humbly and acknowledge our shortcomings, admit that we don't know everything and recognize that our words matter and can be harmful. Personal and social holiness are connected with this because our words don't st just stay with us. They impact others, they impact our community, they impact the world and society. In verses six to eight, James compares the tongue to a small flame that can set a whole forest on fire, meaning that the tongue can contaminate our entire lives and spread around the world like a California wildfire. Words are powerful. Many people say they love God but hate the church because they've been hurt by the words and actions of church members. Sometimes Christians cause harm to others with words and sometimes because believers' words and actions and attitudes don't always match up, others are harmed. Jesus warns in verse 9, about praising God on Sunday morning and then turning around and saying 
hurtful things about and to other people who are made in the very image of that same God they were worshiping Sunday morning. We look like hypocrites to the world when we say nice things and then contradict our words by our actions. James writes that the same mouth should not be a blessing and a curse. John Wesley's first general rule is to do no harm. Part of doing no harm is not just not doing harm by our actions, but also not doing harm by our words and having our words and actions say the same thing. For instance, John Wesley urges people to avoid uncharitable and unprofitable conversation, particularly speaking evil of magistrates or of ministers. The way we talk with or about others should be changed as a result of the salvation we have received through the grace of Jesus Christ. It can change our civil discourse to where we express our opinions and listen to others with different viewpoints, with respect and love. But when we complain or insult our opponents, it shuts down communication and prevents understanding of our opinions. Think of a recent time when tensions were high in your life and ask yourself, what did I say in the situation? How did my words add to the tension or cause harm? And what needs to happen for reconciliation or to prevent this from happening again? Sometimes we're just not sure how to reconcile effectively with some folks without making things worse, feeling threatened or caving in, which can lead to greater resentment. But in humility, we can learn as we decide if and how to express something by thinking about how others might receive our words. Speak honestly, but also be prepared to accept the honest reaction you get. And remember that that other person is trying to express their feelings about something. And remember that feelings are neither right nor wrong. So if someone says something hurtful, if they say, well, you're a no good so-and-so, don't assume they're right and you're evil. Feelings are neither right nor wrong. Yes, listen, but don't assume that you're evil because of what they're saying. We all make mistakes. Some of us due to our own insecurity may feel the need to act superior and portray ourselves as always right or perhaps we lack the humility we lack the humility to reflect on words, how our words will be received. We need to ask ourselves, how does our faith in Christ, our personal holiness, and the realization that our works are our response to God's grace, affect the way we interact with others, even when someone says something that is hurtful? Think about what our church is known for in Shemang and what your vision of our church is versus what others on the outside might see when they look at us. How do our words and actions as a church impact the community we're part of? Would the community miss us if we closed? Many people have had bad experiences with churches in the past, giving them a bad impression of Christianity. How can we work to change that? Perhaps by sharing God's reconciling and gracious love with them as people liberated by God's grace, striving to be more like Christ in our interactions with others, taming our tongues, listening and thinking 
what the other person may be hearing from us before we speak. Words hold the power of life and of death. What we say matters. So let us speak words of life and back up our words with love. Let us pray. Help us, O Lord, to tame our tongues and speak words of love and encouragement. And may our deeds match those words of charity and peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world. When I pray, Lord, in your mercy, please respond with a heartfelt, hear our prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, forgive us for all the ways we stumble by our words and deeds. Tame our tongues to do no harm and to only offer words of encouragement and love that match our actions. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide our nation and all nations to have tamed tongues that do no harm, but only speak words of love and encouragement. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us a living faith that does no harm to your creation, but respects the earth and uses its resources to assist the poor to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Relieve all who suffer, including those we lift up to you either silently in our hearts or aloud in our homes. Give us wisdom to listen and to think how our words will be received before we speak, so we can be used by you as a vehicle of your healing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died. Give us a living faith to share with the world your reign of eternal love. Help us offer your comfort for all who grieve with listening ears and tamed tongues that do no harm. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We offer these prayers through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs> Hey there, Indian Mills, the United Methodist Church family, friends and guests. I pray that we all recognize that our words are very, very powerful and what we say matters. So let's tame our tongues to do no harm and let us speak words of love and encouragement backed up by loving actions. And join us next week as we move from doing no harm to doing all the good we can do. And remember, God loves you, and so do we at the Indian Mills United Methodist Church.